Hello fellow Wargamers and Game Masters, I am Zach and welcome to my channel, Wargamer Stories. I am the Game Master of a Battletech Alpha Strike Chaos campaign taking place in the Tamar Rising Theater of Space. This is a player generated series of battle reports guided by the player's decisions and dice rolls. This is the first battle report of their war campaign between the Vesper Marches and the Aliena Mercantile League. So how did those decisions of the players lead to a clash of battle mechs to take place at the remote town of Emeraldstone on the planet of Blue Hole? Well, let's have a look at the strategic map. The war began in the first week of August 3153. House Corbin's forces were centered mainly around the Cabalton city. Corbin knew that the mercenary unit Hefe's Chupacabras, now employed by the League forces, were in the process of pulling out of the hostile city of Blue Shore. The Chupacabras already moved their headquarters to Azul Harbor City, leaving one company of cavalry mechs to protect the rear. Wanting to capture the headlines with a quick victory, House Corbin ordered his first company of battle mechs to push into Blue Shore. Trying to avoid battle, the Chupacabras' rear guard began to pull out of Blue Shore. However, one mech lance of light cavalry remained in the starport of Blue Shore. The House Corbin player, thinking that he had a grand opportunity to capture or destroy an entire lance of enemy mechs, used additional strategic actions to push their mech company towards Blue Shore. However, using fleet action, the light cavalry lance boarded an assault dropship and lifted into orbit. The Corbin player was a little bummed, but hey, they still got their easy victory by taking the city of Blue Shore. This is when things got interesting. The light cav lance in orbit, Starborn assaulted into the town of Shiverlock. The Corbin player was shocked. He thought the Cobalton power plant was about to be attacked from the light cav lands. I guess the Corbin player figured that the Chupacabras didn't land at the power plant since it had automated defenses that could potentially shoot down their dropship. Well, the Corbin player spent more strategic actions, sending mech lances to reinforce the power plant. But then, the Chupacabra player went north to Melfort and then continued on and assaulted the city of Emeraldstone, which was a communications hub that helps coordinate logistics for House Corbin. The town had one lance of light scouts of provincial guards defending the town, but they stood little chance against mechs. The Corbin player was completely caught off guard and scrambled to dispatch a battle lance of mechs. These mech warriors, however, were still in training, and their pilot skills were all at five. But a battle lance versus a light cavalry lance should even out the odds. Unfortunately, the battle lance will not be at the battlefield when the attack starts. The player will have to roll for reinforcements based on the distance the battle lance needed to travel. Despite this, the House Corbin player was confident that he was about to wipe out an entire enemy mech lance. But House Corbin was still confused about this apparent suicidal maneuver of the light calf, until the Chupacabra player revealed they had dispatched their dropship once again to extract their lance will arrive at turn 5 and will remain there until turn 8. This is when it sank in for House Corbin player. They had been outmaneuvered, but he still had a chance to hurt the Chupacabra player. The Chupacabras were taking a big risk. This is a hit and run mission for the Chupacabras, which means that if anything gets destroyed, there's little chance to recover downed mechs or even their pilots. Speed will be key. Speed, cover, and a little bit of luck will help keep the Chupacabras safe. This is the Battle of Emerald Stone. This is a hit and run mission with a big payout for the attacker. The attacker needs to destroy all the objectives in order to get the full payout. But anything lost here will not be able to be recovered nor can the attacker claim any of the salvage. The primary target is the communications relay station, which is a light building with a construction factor of 3, meaning it has 3 hit points and it's worth 250 war chest points. The secondary targets are the two observation towers which are worth 80 war chest points each, and are also light buildings with construction factor of two. The third objective is the communication tower, worth 40 war chest points. This has a construction factor of one, so in total there are 450 war chest points available for the taking. The House Corbin player could not be present on the day of the battle, and has elected that the battle lance be controlled by the battle aces developed by Catalyst Game Labs. 
Battle Aces is a system of rules and cards that help give artificial intelligence to mechs and govern their actions on the battlefield. At the time of this recording, this system was still in beta version, but we're really excited to see it in action. As for the scout lands, the Corbin player gave me orders on how to use them to defend the town, giving me some wiggle room to control. So let's take a look at House Corbin's forces. First already in the town was the scout lands, which is comprised of four light wheeled vehicles, not much armor or firepower. Their mission is to slow down the advance of the light cavalry as much as possible. The battle lance is en route to the battlefield and has a reinforcement distance of 14. Each turn, the player will roll 2d6, subtracting the rolled result from the distance. Once the distance is reduced to zero or less than that, the lance will have arrived at the battle on that turn. Now the battle lance is comprised of a Loki, two riflemen, and one vulture mark IV. Unfortunately, the mech warriors piloting do not have much experience, and their skill is five. Remember, the higher the skill number, the worse the pilot does in action. This battle lance, however, has the Lucky Special Pilot Ability, or SPA, due to its ground formation type. This allows any mech in the formation one re-roll during combat, and in our house rules, this only allows the player to re-roll the skill die. With the Scout Lance and the Battle Lance, House Corbin has committed just shy of 200 PV, or point value, to the battle. Now for the attacking mercenaries, Hefe's Chupacabras. The player has deployed their 7th Light Cavalry Lance to this hit and run mission, which is worth around 150 PV. The Lance is comprised of one Mad Cat, piloted by a veteran Mech Warrior. The rest of the Lance has two Phoenix Hawks, each with Mech Warriors with regular skill level, and a Fenris, which is piloted by a Mech Warrior still in training with a skill of 5. I want to point out that the Fenris is best in submersible environments which may not come in handy in this battle, but since Blue Hole is mainly water, this mech might be quite useful as the war progresses. The Lance is a light cavalry lance, giving 75% of the unit the special pilot ability of Speed Demon, allowing faster movement on the battlefield. The player gave this ability to the Mad Cat and the two Phoenix Hawks. Alright, now that we got that out of the way, let's get into the Battle of Emerald Stone. Let me start up the dice camera, and let's get rolling. Alright, here we are at turn 1. First, the House Corbin player rolls their reinforcement dice, rolling a 6. The Battle Lance hasn't arrived yet, but they are closing the distance. Next is Initiative. The red dice represents the Chupacabra player, and the white dice is for the House Corbin player. Chupacabras win the initiative with a 7, meaning that House Corbin will need to go first. We are using the Lance rules, in which alternating between players for movement is based on lances and not the individual units. The Scout Lance, however, elected to all stand still, which reduces their TMM, or Target Movement Modifier. But it also reduces their target number, so if any targets come into range, they will have a slight advantage to their shooting. For the Chupacabras, the Fenris went first, doing its full ground movement through the farmer's wheat fields. The Mad Cat follows directly behind the Fenris. The pair of Phoenix Hawks instead move down the right side of the map, closing on the first observation tower. With movement complete, we now go into combat, in which the two Phoenix Hawks fire at the observation tower. The target number is low. The skill of the Phoenix Hawks is 4. The observation tower has a TMM of 0, without any cover, and the range is medium, increasing the target number by 2. Therefore, the target number is 6, and the Phoenix Hawks need to meet or beat this number to score a hit. Okay, before we go into shooting, I wanted to explain a house rule we use. We separate the attacks in our games of Alpha Strike. We roll one red die to represent the skill die of the attacker. If any changes to a dice can be made, they only affect the skill die. Then, for each attack, one white die is also rolled. For example, this Phoenix Hawk, at medium range, has three attacks. So we will roll one red die representing the skill die, then three white dice to represent the three attacks. We will then add the red die result to each individual white die result to see what the outcome of that attack is. If it meets or beats the target number, then it hits the target. Okay, so let's see how the pair of our Phoenix Hawks do. Starting with Phoenix Hawk 1, or Big Red as we like to call her. Oh, she rolled poorly. It must be the adrenaline with the skill die being a 1, first shooting the war and all. However, that meets or beats the target number of 6, which means there are two successful hits. The observation tower is destroyed. No other units has any clear line of sight for shooting, so we go on into the end phase and get ready for turn two. So let's have a quick recap of the turn. 
The battle lance is closing in with a distance of 8, which means there's a good chance that they should show up next round. The scouts hold their position, waiting for the light cav lance to get closer, and an observation tower has been destroyed, earning the chupacabras 80 war chest points. Off to a good start. Starting with reinforcements, and it's a 5. Well, the battle lance still has not arrived, but unless they roll snake eyes next turn, the battle lance should arrive in turn 3. As for initiative, looks like House Corbin wins with an 8, meaning the light cav lance will go first for movement and combat. The Fenris goes first, leaving the wheat fields and skirting along a small copse of trees. The Mad Cat continues to follow behind the Fenris. The pair of Phoenix Hawks begin to cross the road, continuing to push up the right side of the map. The Scout Lance decided to seize the moment and try to inflict as much damage on the Light Cav since the Battle Lance will likely arrive next turn. The Scouts maneuvered into position, getting line of sight on the mechs. On to the combat phase. The Chupacabras lost initiative and therefore need to shoot first. The Fenris fires on Scout 4 at medium range. The target number was 8. The Fenris completely misses with a 6 and a 3. The Mad Cat, focused on the mission, takes aim at the second observation tower at long range. Target number is 7, 3 for the skill, 4 for the range, there's no cover, and the TMM is 0. The Mad Cat scored 2 hits, destroying the observation tower, another 80 war chest points for the Chupacabras. The Big Red Phoenix Hawk, with a skill of 4, takes aim at Scout 1, who is at medium range with cover from the building. The scout moved this round, giving it a TMM of 3, therefore the target number is 10. And with the roll, the Big Red Phoenix Hawk has scored 2 hits, stripping all the armor off of Scout 1. The Little Blue Phoenix Hawk shoots at Scout 2 with the same target number of 10, and was unable to get any successful hits. For House Corbin, Scout 1, 2, and 3 all line up their sights against the Little Blue Phoenix Hawk, which is standing in the open without any cover. Their skill is 5, medium range adds 2 to the target number. The Phoenix Hawk ground moved, adding its TMM of 2 to the target number, which comes out to 9. Scout 1 shoots and misses. Scout 2, on the other hand, scores a critical hit with a roll of boxcars, a 12. Roll 2d6 to check with the critical damage, and it is a 6, which means a weapon hit, reducing Little Blue's attack by 1. Ouch! Scout 3 shoots and rolled an 11, taking 1 point of armor off the Phoenix Hawk. Scout 4, hiding at the edge of the village, takes a shot at the Fenris. The scout skill is 5, with a medium range giving it plus 2 to the target number, and the Fenris ground moves so its TMM is 3. Therefore the target number is 10, and the scout missed with a roll of an 8. So that brings turn 2 to a close. The scouts attack, dealing critical damage to the little blue Phoenix Hawk, destroying one of its weapons. Scout 1 took some hits, losing all of its armor, and since it only has one structural point and no armor, it is forced to withdraw and will be spending the remainder of the battle trying to beat feet off the map. Alright, let's get into turn 3. Alright, let's take a look at the reinforcement roll, and yep, with a roll of 8, the Battle Lance has definitely arrived this turn. Alright, now for initiative, remember red dice is Chupacabras and the white dice is for House Corbin, and they both rolled a 7. So let's do a re-roll, and looks like House Corbin wins initiative with an 11. Chupacabras must move first. The pair of Phoenix Hawks take cover behind some industrial equipment for water processing. The Fenris rushes forward, taking cover behind that house at the edge of the town, crushing a stone wall fence in the process. The Mad Cat moves into the copse of trees to get some cover, and maybe some line of sight on the scouts. Scout 1 pulls back and is driving hard and fast to get out of town as it withdraws. The rest of the scouts pull back to the edge of town as well, getting behind cover of buildings and some woods. As for the Battle Lance, each mech draws a card, and that card dictates their actions for this turn, following a list of priorities. The Rifleman 1 drew the card with priority number of 243. This means it will go first, and if this mech is the first to go, then it must follow specific instructions, which in this case is move to line of sight with cover from the enemy. The Vulture is next, it can't accomplish the first instruction, so it will instead ground move towards cover. Rifleman 2 is next in priority, and it can't do the first two of its instructions, so it will do the third, which is ground move towards cover. The Loki is last, and it will ground move towards the enemy with the lowest health, which in this case is Phoenix Hawk 2, the Little Blue. 
The Chupacabras are the first to fire, and the Mad Cat fires at Loki, hoping to soften up the mech at long range. The target number is 10, and all the shots miss. Next up is the Fenris, shooting at Scout 4 hiding behind a building. The target number is 11, and scores one hit, taking one armor point from the Scout. Little Blue Phoenix Hawk takes aim at Scout 3. The target number is 8, but because the Phoenix Hawks had a weapon destroyed, it could only roll two attacks instead of three. Unfortunately for him, he missed because his skill die was a 1. Big Red Phoenix Hawk shoots at the communications tower, the third objective for this mission. This time, the tower has some intervening woods, providing some cover, making the target number 7. And she too rolled poorly on the skill die, but was still able to hit and destroy the tower which likely scared the mess out of Scout 1, who's trying to make their way out of town, when right next to them, BOOM! Scout 3 with a target of 11 shoots at the Little Blue, and misses. And Scout 4 with a target number of 12 shoots at the Fenris, and also misses. Next up is the Loki, shoots at the Mad Cat, since it was the only enemy it had line of sight on. Due to the range, cover, skill, and TMM, the target number comes out to 12, and it missed. Then Rifleman 1 also shoots at the Mad Cat with a target number of 12. It was close. If the skill die was to 6, it would result in a hit. So the Rifleman used one of its 6 lucky points in order to re-roll the skill die. And it still is a miss. Too bad. That brings turn 3 to a close. The Battle Lance arrived and there was a lot of shooting, but only Scout 4 took a hit and the comms tower was blown up by the Big Red, earning the Chupacabras another 40 war chest points. The main objective, the communications relay station, is still fully intact. With the arrival of the Battle Lance, the Light Cav have lost their short window of opportunity. The dropship to extract the Chupacabras will arrive in two turns, and if they cannot destroy the communications relay next turn, they will be hard pressed to complete the mission without any casualties. Remember, this is a hit and run mission. If the Chupacabras lose any mechs here, they will not be able to rescue the mech warriors, nor attempt to repair and salvage the destroyed mechs. Instead, they will all fall in the hands of the enemy. Turn 4 is a make or break for the Chupacabras. So let's get into it. Turn 4 initiative roll. The Chupacabras win with a 9. House Corbin will move first and alternate to the Chupacabras. House Corbin opted to move the scout first. Scout 1 successfully withdrew from the battlefield. The remaining scouts stood still. This lowered their TMM, but improves their target number for combat later in this turn. The movement phase now alternates to the Chupacabras. Little Blue shifted a little to his left, but not enough movement to count as a ground move, so he is still considered standing still. This improves his target number as he lines up a shot on the communications relay station, but it also means he will be easier to hit. The Fenris, like the Little Blue Phoenix Hawk, did not do enough movement to ground move, but instead shifted a little in order to have line of sight on the primary target. Big Red ground moved to the edge of the village, taking cover behind a Tudor house. She also has a clear line of sight of the primary objective, however, she is now the farthest unit forward. When the dropship arrives, there is a four turn extraction window. Hopefully she will be able to make it back in time to the dropship. The Mad Cat moved out of the woods and up to the edge of town, getting cover behind some of the houses, and also lining up a shot of the primary target. Now for the Battle Lance, using Battle Aces. Rifleman 2 has the priority, and it moves up the hill into some woods to get a higher elevation and snatch itself some cover. Rifleman 1 is next up. It went with its second movement option and found itself some cover. The Vulture was next in priority, also went to higher elevation and got some cover. And finally the Loki, which couldn't do the first movement instruction, so instead it went towards the Fenris because it was the enemy with the highest movement. Alright, into the combat phase. Scout 4 did not have a line of sight, so it couldn't fire on anything. Scout 2 shot at the Fenris with a target number of 9. It's plus 6 for the scout skill, plus 1 for the intervening woods, plus 1 for the cover for the Fenris, plus 0 TMM because the Fenris did not move enough, plus 2 for medium range, but minus 1 because the scout also stood still this turn. And it still misses. Scout 3 had a lower target number of 8 because it wasn't shooting through woods when it shot at Little Blue, and it scored a hit, taking another point of armor off the mech. Rifleman 2 opts to overheat, giving itself an additional attack dive while it's shooting at Big Red, with a target number of 10, and it scores 2 hits. Even though it has lucky points, it cannot use them now because it can only influence the skill die for our games. 
Rifleman 1 also chose to overheat so that it can take an additional attack die. It also is shooting at Big Red with a target number of 10. It will use a lucky point to reroll in this case and it has 3 hits on Big Red. She no longer has any armor and if she takes any more than half structural damage she is going to have to withdraw and save herself. Things are not looking good for Big Red. Now it's the Vulture's turn to shoot, who has to fire at a target it can destroy, which is Big Red. The target number is 10 and the Vulture doesn't have any ability to overheat, so will only fire 5 attack dice at Big Red. And with the roll, and it will use a lucky point to re-roll the skill die, and whew, it still misses every single shot. Now it's the Loki, who takes aim at the Fenris with a target number of 8 and scores 1 hit on the Fenris. The Mad Cat lines up his sights on the communications relay station and decides to also overheat adding an additional attack die. It is medium range so plus 2 to target number, the veteran mech warrior has a 3 skill so plus 3 to target number, and there are intervening woods so another plus 1 to the target number. Therefore the target number comes out to 6. 6 attack dice needing to meet or beat the target number of 6. The comms relay station has a construction factor of 3 so he needs to score 3 hits to completely destroy it. He only needed 3 but he hit with 6. The primary target has been destroyed. The Fenris returns fire at the Loki with a target number of 8 and that's too bad. Right now I am sure the Fenris wish it had lucky points so it could reroll that skill die. But it doesn't so all the attacks miss. Little Blue also takes a shot at Loki with 1 die removed due to the sustained critical damage to its weapons and it has a target number of 7, and it hits the Loki taking one of its armor points. Finally there's Big Red, with a target number of 6, shoots at the Vulture and scores a hit with a 10. Now we're at the end phase. This is when the overheat takes effect giving the two riflemen and the Mad Cat heat, which reduces their attack die by 1 for each level of heat and reduces movement by 2 for each level of heat. This will take effect for next round's movement and shooting. Well that brings turn 4 to an end, there was a lot of shooting that took place. The Mad Cat was able to destroy the primary target, and next turn the dropship will arrive. Therefore the hit and run mission, the hit part is done, now it's for the run part. And the Chupacabras are in a real tough spot. Big Red has no armor left, completely shredded off. She is still the farthest mech forward, and unfortunately she has the farthest to run to get back to the dropship. Turn 5 begins with the dropship roaring onto the battlefield. If the farmer was upset earlier about mechs marching through his wheat field, well, he's surely ticked off now. The dropship lands in the wheat field, setting them ablaze. Alright, let's take a look at the initial roll, and the Chupacabras win it with a 6. The Vulture draws the 135 card, and it moves into cover. Rifleman 1 pulls the 212 card, and it can only do the fourth instruction and 3 inches of movement because of heat and the woods. Rifleman 2 moves to the highest elevation and finds some cover. The Loki went with option 3 and moved towards the lowest health, which in this case is Big Red. Now the Chupacabras take their turn for movement. The Mad Cat moves back towards the dropship's port side hatches. It is still overheated and therefore moves 2 inches slower than it did before, leaving it out in the open. Next up is the Fenris, who is also making its way back to the port side hatches and moves past the Mad Cat. Little Blue moves towards the starboard hatches, putting as much woods between it and the enemy. That leaves Big Red, who has the farthest to run. She is in the open trying to get across the highway. Now the move phase alternates back to House Corbin, who moves the scouts now. The scouts are wheeled vehicles, and when they spend all their movement on pavement, they get an additional 2 inches of movement. Therefore they spend all 16 inches of movement to try to put themselves in between Big Red and the dropship they want to cut off her escape. On to the combat phase. Scout 4, despite its extended movement range, was unable to get a line of sight on any of the Chupacabras and cannot take a shot. However, Scout 2 and 3 are within short range of Big Red, with a skill of 6, 0 for the range, 0 for cover, and 2 for the Big Red's target movement modifier, that makes a target number of 8. Scout 2 misses, but Scout 3 hits, which is structural damage, which might have a critical damage. And it does. It scores an engine hit. 
which causes the Phoenix Hawk to generate heat every time it fires its weapons. Rifleman 1 and 2 both fire at a target with the lowest TMM and in line of sight, which is the Mad Cat standing out in the open. They both still have heat and therefore both will roll with one less attack die. The target number comes out to 12. Rifleman 1 fires and misses every shot. Rifleman 2, however, scores one hit, which is a roll 12, which means it is potentially a critical hit. And it is, the critical hit destroys one of the Mad Cat's weapons. Trying to save Big Red from being further attacked by the scouts, Fenris shoots at Scout 3 with a target number of 10 and misses. The Mad Cat also shoots at Scout 2, but only rolls three dice. One less attack die due to heat, and one less attack die due to weapon destroyed, and it misses with all three attacks. Little Blue has line of sight on Scout 3 and attempts to shoot at it with a target number of 10, but it also misses. The dropship just arrived this turn, so we have a house rule stating dropships cannot fire on the first turn it arrives, making it more vulnerable and thus add suspense to our players, which the Chupacabras are feeling now, because Big Red has a choice to make now. If she fires, she will generate heat, meaning she will move slower next turn and attack less next turn. It's a gamble, but she is a chupacabra, so she goes for the attack. With a skill of 3, range of 0, cover of 0, and 4 for the TMM of the Scout 2, means she has a target number of 7. And she nailed it. 3 points of damage, which rips through the 2 armor points and the 1 point of structure, making it the first unit destroyed in this war. Alright, taking a look back at turn 5, the Chupacabras are running for their lives, with House Corbin scouts hot on their tails. The Battle Lance is too slow for pursuit, but they do have line of sight and have been taking shots at the fleeing mercenaries. Mad Cat lost a weapon, and Big Red took a structural damage that critically damaged her engine. She has just a little bit farther to go to get on board the dropship. Alright, here we are in turn 6, and the Chupacabras just lost the initiative which is actually fortuitous. This enables the Chupacabras to go first, which is what they want. Little Blue scrambles up the ramp into the safety of the dropship. Big Red slowed by the overheating last round, she limps toward the dropship, putting as much woods between her and the enemy. The Fenris hightails it on board the dropship. The Mad Cat backs up four inches, but stays on the battlefield just in case if it needs to give covering fire for Big Red. The scouts, fearing the barrage of firepower from the dropship for this turn, take cover into the village. The vulture drew the 135 card and moves into cover. Loki drew the card requiring it to sprint to where it has no line of sight of the enemy, and it moves into the village of Emerald Stone. Raffleman 2, with card 243, pursues the enemy and ground moves towards the enemy, however a little slower since it is still running with heat. Raffleman 1 stands still, and it still has line of sight on the Mad Cat and it does plan to shoot him down. However, the Mad Cat shoots first. It has reduced dice because of range and heat, and a destroyed weapon, therefore only one attack die will be rolled. The target number is 9, and the Mad Cat actually hit the Rifleman, taking one point off of the armor for it. Rifleman 1 shoots back at the Mad Cat. It has a target number of 12 again, and it misses. At this point, the battle was called because there was no way to prevent the Chupacabras from boarding and escaping in the dropship. So, how'd they do? The Chupacabras destroyed all their objectives, earning a total of 450 war chest points. However, they sustained a lot of damage, and that makes a total expenditure of 340 war chest points. Not a big payout for the Chupacabras, but House Corbin didn't fare all that well either. They failed to destroy any of the attacking mechs. The only salvage was their own scout destroyed in the battle, but House Corbin forces also sustained 6 points of armor loss, which is 60 war chest points to repair, as well as 35 war chest points to resupply the ammunition for the mechs and scouts. Also, it cost about 200 war chest points to deploy their army, so House Corbin lost a lot of war chest points in this battle. And let's not forget, the logistics capability of Emerald Stone was destroyed, which will have a long-term effect on the logistics for the House Corbin. However, Blue Shore City was taken without firing a shot, so that's a win for House Corbin. All in all, the first battle of the war, both sides did not fare well, but this is only the first battle of many more. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment below. 
you want to see more videos and battle reports from Battletech and historicals and fantasy, please subscribe to the channel. And if you want to help the channel grow, check out our Patreon page and see if there's anything there that might interest you. Okay, Wargamers, I'll see you next time.